John Kasich says he balanced the budget without smoke and mirrors, but there's still a little haze. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Daryl Rowland, public affairs editor for the Columbus Dispatch. Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press. Terry Casey, Republican strategist, and Brian Rothenberg, executive director for Progress Ohio. For weeks, we were ready for a bloodbath. Eight billion dollars in red ink and a vow not to raise taxes was going to leave John Kasich with no choice but to make devastating across-the-board cuts. Well, on Tuesday, there seemed to be more applause than catcalls as the governor released his spending plan. But we have balanced this budget with no smoke and mirrors, and we have done it with a reform agenda that will put Ohio on a path to growth. Here's how the governor wants to balance the budget. State aid to local government takes the biggest hit. Cities and towns would lose half of their state aid over the next two years. K-12 through education will see a 15% cut, but that's mainly due to the end of the federal stimulus money. Same holds true for higher ed. No more stimulus money means an 8% cut over the next two years. And the Kasich administration vows reforms, which will save, they say, $1.5 million in Medicaid. Now, folks, I have to tell you, no politics here. Oh, you know, maybe a smidge here and there about the reality of what you do. But we got rid of the politics. You see, if you try to balance budgets and you show favoritism, or you have favored groups or somebody that you know, and you start doing that, you lose the high moral ground. People can accept change as long as the change is distributed in a fair and an honest way. Daryl Rowland, is this budget as bad as many people feared? It's probably not as bad as many people feared, but some of the fears were a little bit off the wall as well. Uh, you know, the apocalypse w- was feared. Uh, the Day of Reckoning did finally come this week. Uh, I-, I remember my colleague Jim Siegel did a story after the 2009, or the state budget was passed in 2009, saying just wait till the next one. And then all throughout the campaign, neither Strickland nor Casey would give us details. So finally, we have some uh, numbers on paper, although we're still waiting for language. Um, You know, I think the governor's performance uh, in rolling out the budget, holding a town hall meeting, uh, boy, this looked like the the former chairman of the House Budget Committee, uh, Congressional Budget Committee. Uh, The personal knowledge he had on this uh, was was obviously vast. Now, whether you like uh, that budget uh, is a whole different uh, story, of course. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that you saw this week was that in terms of him saying he has balanced these interests, he was getting both uh, praise and and some criticism on both sides, including the conservative Buckeye Institute had some reservations. He got some positives from hospitals and universities that were cut in this budget. And so it was interesting to see that, you know, at least some of what we were getting as the press seemed to be showing that they were um, they were balancing or spreading that pain, if you will. One of the big uh, predictions was there was going to be massive cuts of state employees, and that didn't happen. Uh, But clearly, a lot of the doom and gloom, uh, it's not as bad as what some people predicted. Uh, And in fact, a lot of state employees are going to get restored that 3.7 percent that they got cut out of on those furlough days. No more furloughs so they get that money because right. they'll be working. I mean, right. one, Which one was important in the contract already. But. Right, but he could have ignored it and one, said, no, we won't do that. But on the, on the other hand, I mean, one important thing to keep in mind is, is uh, we did kick the can a little bit on this. I mean, you know, we kicked the can on a lot of the cuts down to the local government level. There's about a billion dollars that I counted in accounting gimmicks and other things that are basically one-time only things you can do, like redoing the financing and paying back some of the finances. Um, you you um, uh, are looking at a lot of assumptions in terms of the phase-in on some of the Medicaid stuff, which I thought was great. But um, I'm not sure that we've solved structurally the real problem here because we really didn't solve the revenue issue. We kicked some of the problems in other directions. But, but a big part of solving the revenue problem, as the semi then and now former development director uh, noted, if Ohio had a much lower unemployment rate, there'd be an extra $14 billion. So clearly, and I think they noted in the town meeting that 
uh, the first year, there's a little more gimmicks that have been done in the past, done this time. But by the second year, they're back to a little more of reality on where your income is and where you're spending. Aside from the stimulus money, the federal stimulus money, which runs out, the state portion of the budget actually increased, Terry. Right. Does that mean, aside from the stimulus money, that Ted Strickland's budget was not all that bloated? Well, you know, one of the things, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, and one of the things that's going to help John Kasich is that slowly, as happens in all economies after you've had a downturn, it's slowly bouncing back, like the unemployment rate in Ohio is down to 9.2 at the peak when Ted Strickland was governor, it was up to 10.8, 10.9. So the economy is slowly getting better, and this governor is benefiting from better revenue projections, particularly in the second year of the two-year budget. I mean, one of the things that um, helped you sort of increase the amount of spending that's going on at the state level were the projections, were the one-time spending monies, but also the amount that was kicked at the lower level that wasn't actually on book. For instance, I've got a memo that I got today from Damon Asbury that was passed along to me. He's uh, Director of Legislative Services for OS OSBA. He's predicting the actual cut to school districts in Ohio is going to wind up being $3.1 billion by going through the different line items in the full effect. Right, OSBA is the School Board Association. Right, Go and ahead. that's billion that we're talking yeah. about. I mean, I think that there is a lot yet to be discovered in this budget. I've been trying to pull it apart this week, and uh, for example, he has taken, or they have taken, uh, a broad brush look and tried to spread, they say, both the pain and the deficit over uh, not only the general revenue fund, which is sort of the bank account paid for by taxpayers, but also the non-general revenue. And what you see there is things like cuts to the Office of Consumers Council and cuts uh, at EPA and things like that. These are fee-based programs. So I'm still trying to figure out, well, where are these cuts? Who, who benefits from that? Are those, are those fee cuts that are going back to those fee payers, like the polluters and the utilities, or are those actual reductions in the budget? Because the numbers are up in terms of how much we're spending. So, Darrell, that's the question. First, is the, is the deficit really $8 billion, or are they assuming it's going to be closer to maybe 6 We've heard up to $8 billion. And will this budget hold up? I think we need John Kerry in the room to help this discuss this because it's a little bit of both, you know. So at the risk of sounding like the flip-flopper from, from <laughs> 2004. But part of the problem is that when we talk about the state budget, we sort of had the ground rules on what the state budget was, and that was the general revenue fund. This budget pulls a lot of stuff in from elsewhere, uh, part of it from the Medicaid funds, from the, where the stimulus money was run through. Um, yeah, this budget, just the bottom line of the GRF, General Revenue Fund, went up 10 percent. $5 billion. So you solved an $8 billion hole, you added $5 billion, and you're wondering about the math. But it does work, but if you want to call those accounting gimmicks or whatever, but you have to talk about budgets in an entirely different way. Let's they, get to, go ahead, Julie. I was just going to say, and you have to look at some of these little things that they're doing that are, they're really uh, inventive in terms of things like people have read that there's going to be a dollar fee for the prisoners and there's going to for be. The electricity, yeah. Right, and, and all sorts of little things like that to so, make money. So what does it all mean? Advocates for the poor kind of applauded the budget because the, if there were cuts, they weren't too bad. Mayors and city administrators complained, of course, because of the cut in the state aid to local governments. School officials still have lots of questions, and we've heard some, but not a whole lot, from the hospital and nursing home administrators about the Medicaid changes. So, Julie Carr-Smythe, there's still a lot of questions. You've alluded to that. To get what Brian was talking about, kicking the can down the road, will this lead to levies? both on the school side and the city side, to make up for these cuts? Well, there's an interesting element at the local level, which is we have these casinos coming in. They're talking about the fact that that casino money is going to roll in. Um, and I think Budget Director Tim Keene was fair when he said these local governments should have been prepared for the loss of this tangible personal property tax because it was supposed to expire anyway. Um, but th that being said, yeah, they'll have to make it up somewhere. If, if they can't get leaner, then they'll have to ask for more tax money at the local level. You know, it's an interesting uh, example of budget as philosophy, again, to, to underscore the fact that you know, elections matter. This is the direction we're going to go in Ohio, um, whether voters knew they were voting for this or not. I mean, I think they should have if they were paying attention. But hey, John Kasich is a true conservative Republican. He's driving down the size of government. And he's trying to exact that same philosophy down at the local level. And frankly, he's saying we're cutting here at the state level. If you guys can't cut at the local level, well, that's on you. That's not on me.
And a lot of the local governments can, if they want to take advantage of it, save some money as changes are made in collective bargaining. I mean, one little thing, and maybe some newspapers don't like it, but millions of dollars were spent each year on these legal ad ads in newspapers that nobody read, and you can use the web and make it easier both for the people that supply the services and save local governments money. Now, it's going to hurt some newspapers on the revenue side because they made a lot of money out of that legal advertising, but there's a lot of tools given to local governments to help them save money. And you might mention on the local government fund, they're not going to be cut 50% of their total budget because Just a lot of municipalities, the amount they get out of that local government fund might be one or two or three yeah. percent. So if you lose 25 percent of that first year, it's relatively small. But, but there's there is there is the reality that not every government is going to get casino money. The the so-called changes, and I'm not even sure the the collective bargaining changes will ever happen. But they're going to be delayed at least for the first year of this, and could be delayed for two years until it goes to the ballot. Um, and when you talk to most local governments, they've already bargained about a lot of the pension issues. So most of those are either locked in contracts, and in many cases, those local governments are already requiring their employees to pay that extra share. So it's no savings. The the end result of this is a dramatic shift, which has been going on in Ohio since the 1970s to local revenue being and local taxation being much higher than it is in other places and it continues to do that dramatic shift and the end result is going to be wealthier communities that can pass a levy you guys are going to have more services and poorer communities that can't pass a levy you guys are going to have less services and it's going to be fee based and eventually it's going to be coming around back to the state government to provide some of these services either through Medicaid or other sort of but, but it costs. puts more of a burden back on local taxpayers to look at what's the school district paying at administrators. Mm -hmm. Look at it. There's one township here in Franklin County in the northwest part of the county. Their carryover balance is 83% of their budget. Uh, Let's so get to the townships. John Kasich said during the campaign, and he said it during his budget announcement, is that local governments need to consolidate. Right. We have to consolidate townships or school districts. And you mentioned one county, the small county, that had six school districts. Julie, do you see that happening? I mean, we've been hearing about this for a long time. Uh, it is, if there's the political force, I wouldn't say will, but if there's a political force in Columbus with the, the control that's going on, I mean, it it makes a certain amount of sense, but I've already seen some of the smaller papers around the state bringing this up and pointing out to individual districts and schools and, and uh, you know, nobody wants to shrink their schools and, and shrink mm -hmm. their control of their own kids' school districts. But there's ways to save money like on pooling health insurance because if you put all the school districts together and like in Franklin County, different library districts work together and share a common database and move materials between the libraries. Not all libraries do that, but there's a lot of ways on government operations, particularly the back room things, people are concerned about getting the service. And if they can buy salt, they can buy health care in a group and save more money, that's a winner for the taxpayers. And we all think as residents that, you know, when you're driving along in the winter and you're on a nice cleared street and you and you pop into a new municipality and now it's filled with snow. Uh, you know, we all think that doesn't make any sense. Why didn't that, that snow plow just drive right on down there? But it's more complicated than that because it's who's paying for it and who's paying the uh, supply of the salt and the buy of the, the truck. just in Ohio in general shows that local governments, as much as they'll try to consolidate and they'll try to slash their services, it shows that increasingly they're going to wind up increasing fees and increasing revenue, and that's that's the concern. I mean, no matter what the accounting gimmicks are to add the $5, bil $5 billion into this budget, the bottom line is it's either money that we kick down to the future, like the sale of the prisons, that eventually we wind up paying over time, or it's cuts to these local governments. How about Medicaid? Eligibility doesn't change. They say there's no cuts in, in its services to the patients, but we're going to save one and a half billion dollars over two years. Daryl, how, do, how is that going to work? What's, who's going to who's going to <coughs> who's going to pay for that? Yeah, first of all, now unlike some of the rest of these things, this is not a cut. When we talk about savings, yeah, that's true. This is a savings, but it's yeah. just it would have been up here. Yeah. Now it's down here. So, since Medicaid is the biggest single chunk of the state budget, even that is significant. Uh, One point four billion that they're going to save. Um, nursing homes, hospitals, managed care companies are the, are the big three getting the hits here. And you're right, the, the individuals getting the services, uh, the eligibility doesn't change, and the services doesn't change. Even such things as 
you know, podiatry and dental services, vision. That's still part of your Medicaid package in Ohio. But nursing homes, uh, you listen to the nursing home owners, they're saying, you know, Granny's going to be out in the street with this because we can't afford it. And so you're going to be seeing that on television, I'm going to bet, in a few weeks. Well, those are commercials. The question is, is it really true? Because just like school administrators who don't look at their bureaucracy but always say, let's cut out sports or extracurricular, the nursing home people play games in claiming there's such impacts that aren't necessarily going to be true. Well, this is one area that I think both Terry and I across the table actually probably agree on. I mean, I'm part of a, a number of coalitions that we're looking at this, including some of these um, consolidations and things that the um, Obama administration has been looking at with health care reform. The question really is going to be, will it produce those savings that quickly, and will it do it? You're going from a provider-based system into a patient-centered system in a very big shift. Will there be enough personnel to do it? Will there be enough equipment? Can you do it in a year? And the only concern I have about whether those numbers hold up is how quickly you can transition from that new system. And that's a big bottom line question on this budget, which is basically there is an immense amount of reform wedged in here. There's sentencing reform, nursing home reform, you know, health care reform, uh, and it's just a lot to lift in the next few months before June. And the sentencing reform could really save some significant money because of the general fund, the biggest operation of state government out of the general fund besides money distributed out to others is running the prisons and there's an awful lot of people in prison who are not violent people or they're in there for such a short time, do they really belong in prison? Okay, let's get to our third topic. John Kasich's approval ratings are down. Not surprising for a new executive serving in a difficult time. But Kasich's numbers are pretty far down there. The Ohio poll shows Kasich's approval rating stands at 40 percent, with 47 percent of those surveyed disapproving of his performance. Kasich has the worst approval rating for a brand new governor in 28 years. And Terry, this poll was done before he released the budget. Well, maybe it'll be better after the budget. The reality is polling like this, and you mentioned 20-some years ago, that's when Dick Celeste was governor and he came in in 83 when the economy was really bad. So a lot of times, office holders, whether they're presidents, governors, or mayors, when people feel the state or the nation's on the wrong track, they tend to be very negative. The good news for John Kasich, just like Ronald Reagan in 1981, he's got a long time before the next election, and people are going to say, did it work or did it not work? And the politician always gets higher ratings. The winning politician gets, right. always gets higher ratings than the actual governing official, because you have to make bad decisions or decisions that make people mad. Um, sure was a short honeymoon, though, no, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, but part of it is you, you can't make comments like calling a cop an idiot and it not catch up with you and, you know, keeping the press corps away from your inaugural, threatening to keep them away from your budget thing. I mean, these are, these are things that aren't helping. I mean, he's got a bad enough economy. He's got a bad enough hand he's been dealt. But you can't do that kind of stuff and keep your numbers up. I mean, his leadership style is very assertive, very confident, and I, and I think a lot of people like that. But there is there's danger, there's fragility, and, and he only won by two percentage points, first of all. Only a little over half of Ohioans voted. So going into the year, he only has supporters from, what, 25, 30 percent of Ohioans at most. Uh, then you start doing risky things. And even some people in your own party, if you listen to the whispers closely enough, uh, you know, they're not too keen on you either. Yeah, and the poll showed 52 percent of independents uh, are disapproving of John Kasich right now, which is a key number. Although I think a, another factor to keep in mind with him is, I, you know, I don't know that he cares a lot. I think he expected this. I ex think he expected to alienate people, and he felt it was necessary, even when he decided to run two or more years ago, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to come in here and shake some things up. Does it make it hard for a Republican lawmaker, a member of the House or the Senate, who's in a tight district, for now anyway, to go along with all of his plans if, if he really is that unpopular? I think if you talk to most of the legislator, legislators, they know these changes have to happen. And by getting them done in the early part of 11, you've got a lot of time for people to see the economy to improve, more jobs to come in,
people to realize. I mean, it's just like on the budgets we talked about. Everybody said it was going to be so terrible, but once they see the budget, I mean, one key thing in this budget, there's no sales tax increase, and to make up an $8 billion deficit, it would have meant four cents on every dollar you'd buy. You'd have to increase the sales tax. Let's get to another question in that poll. Speaking of tax increases, the Ohio poll asked Ohioans how they would balance the budget, and 53% said they would favor a combination of Tech of spending cuts and tax hikes. 35% said cuts only, and 6% said tax hikes only. Terry Casey, you were in that 6% group, is that correct? Well, I think he's <laughs> proven that you can do it, and in fact, in New York State, a guy named Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo, says in New York, no tax increases, and even Jerry Brown is saying no new tax increases. So it isn't just in Ohio that governors recognize the voters, the middle class, don't want to pay more in but taxes. It could have been really transformational with this budget if he'd, if he'd sort of looked at different other alternatives. You, you give a tax cut, um, the last year of the income tax cut, which really hasn't produced new jobs the first four times you did it, he, he gives it to um, what would essentially help 40% of it goes to people making over $135,000 a year. You, you didn't even touch the corporate tax loopholes, which even the Columbus Dispatch editorials last fall were talking about, you know, some of these loopholes should be looked at because not all of them, but some of these loopholes, um, I mean, do you really need to give a, a tax break to people who want to buy a yacht or a part of a uh, corporate jet or NASCAR racing. I mean, these are all legitimate things that he just ignored and glossed over. He, it could have been a real transformational budget if he looked at the revenue side. Of course, it was Governor Stricken who actually let the, the well, last round of the tax cuts take effect, right at, right at the tail end of his, I, and I think of his was, term. I think now, it's interesting to me that mistake. the Democrats have gone back to criticizing the tax cuts because Ted Stricken was Well, I've been was consistent about that. I'm, I'm, years, just saying, I'm not pointing right yeah, at you, but yeah, Democrats yeah. in general. I actually, talk, I'll point to one. I talked to Armand Butish right after the... Uh, the budget, or actually after the state of the state, and they were just ripping on this 21% tax, and you know, and we're helping the rich and all that. And it's like you were real quiet for four years yeah. while Governor Strickland was in office because he favored it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to our final topic: controversy again swirls around the state agency that oversees public schools in Ohio. State Superintendent Deborah Delisle abruptly resigned this week. She said two Kasich staff members told her that they had the school board votes to replace her, so she quit. That prompted claims of political interference from Democrats. Brian Rothenberg, there's a new governor, new party in charge. Can't they pick the superintendent of schools? Well, what really happened here is that there was a school board member named Martha Harris from Cleveland, lovely lady. She, uh, there was allegedly a paperwork snafu. She says that she actually had the right paperwork sent in. Uh, the governor came in, replaced her. She didn't even know she was replaced. They never bothered to call her. She found out when she showed up at a meeting. Um, it went to the courts. It was pretty ugly. And the whole reason they did that was to get rid of this one school board member, put somebody else in their place so that they could fire the superintendent, essentially, or put in a new school board president to get rid of that. But I find it ironic that this current and outgoing school superintendent got there because the previous school superintendent for about eight or nine years, Ted Strickland, very vocally in the state of the state and other things, with a sharp stick said, I want you out, and then his chief of staff sits in with the state school board to pick this woman. So she's complaining about politics, <laughs> but she got there because of politics in the first place. I'm just amazed that there's actually politics on school boards. <laughs> well, I mean, John Kasich said they're doing away with politics. Let's do away with politics on all school boards. This is really charters versus, you know, charter advocates versus public school advocates is and what this, this is, comes down to. Right, and this board is, you know, it's supposed to be constructed in a way that's somewhat immune from politics. I mean, in theory, we have elected and appointed yep. members of it. We have an, uh, an internal election for the uh, superintendent. Uh, they have a term that is, you know, dependent upon the board to decide. Uh, and th we saw the same thing with Kasich and uh, the chancellor uh, of higher ed leaving a couple weeks ago, who should have been serving a five-year term and left. But he left gracefully. And one person on the board, Todd Jones, uh, said, this could have all happened behind closed doors, Daryl. <laughs> well, I admire his honesty, but do we want that happening? I know. I was, I was literally taking text messages from my colleague Kathy Kandiski, who was at this meeting, so we could get it online right yeah. away. And she says, people are just crying. And she's, it's the craziest school board meeting she's ever been at, much less a state school board meeting. Yeah. But yeah, it's the, I, I think that's, I mean, Terry and Brian are both right. This is somewhat political. This was set up, remember, by the state senate refusing to confirm any of Ted Strickland's appointees 
to the state school board. So it started out with overt power politics by the Republicans. All right, we've got to get to our final off-the-record parting shots. We'll start with you, Brian Rothenberg. I predict you're going to see a lot of te television commercials from the nursing home industry in the next few months to get back in play in the House, and they will succeed partially. Okay. Terry? I predict you're going to see something unusual out of John Kasich, which is his continuing to reach out to Democrats, uh, whether it's Capri Cafaro in the Senate, a lot of African-American legislators. And I watched during the State of the State and the town hall meeting as John Kasich on sentencing reform, certain things to help the neediest and provide the safety net where he's overtly and I think successfully reaching out to some parts of the Democrat legislature. And I think it's going to pay off. Julie. I think you're going to hear some more talk about charter universities, and I think if we allow universities this flexibility, you will see big t tuition increases. And Daryl? I think there's a few bumps in the road still for Senate Bill 5 that the would gut collective bargaining. Uh, again, some of my colleagues are hearing that the House is considering some odd referendum process to resolve disputes, uh, and the Senate doesn't, doesn't like that at all. And they only passed by one vote in the Senate, so they risk reversing that. Okay. I have to give kudos to Julie Carr Smythe, who a few weeks ago predicted that Mark Kwame, the development director, would be moved out of that position. John Kasich announced Friday today that he will be the new director of job creation and that a new job, or development director, James Leftwich, will take over. And that, Brian, that ends your, ends your well, lawsuit. It will end the lawsuit. And, you know, we knew all along this would happen. We waited. Constitution okay. is the Constitution. All right. And Terry, 10 seconds, last word on that? Uh, I'm all for jobs. We need them in Ohio. Okay. <laughs> Staying on message. That is Columbus <laughs> on the Record for this week. Please check us out online or on Facebook or on Twitter. You can connect to all of that at our website, wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew here at WOSU at COSI and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.